as it's saying. Ah, like yes. yes. Oh, no. I'm actually very happy. I posted a video of the quartet from the end of the first movement, and I haven't gotten any comments of people telling me I played the wrong notes because there's like a new edition that changed some of the notes around. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm just playing on the Dover score, so I'm like, all right, I hope that <laughs> I hope this is good enough. I figured it would be the one that is on IMSLP would be the better one to record, but you never know. Uh, I think there's a transposed version there, right? Isn't there one that's like been written out in F? Yeah, I made my own part just because um, I don't know what edition they made it off of. <clears throat> I have to, I have to, we just bought a new set the orchestra did, so I'm trying to make sure I met. I have no I mean, it, with Bruckner scores, you have no idea. There's, yeah, you know, there's prints and letterings and all sorts of stuff. So I figured I'd just. Mm -hmm start from there oh it's very strange seeing myself uh in the live stream as i copy this link <laughs> yeah Here. I wonder when I pause the stream, screen sharing, does it actually go back? I have no way to know. We'll find out. <clears throat> Now we can check to see if anyone has bothered to join the stream. We have eight people watching. Oh, great. Hello, eight people. I'm so sorry that I'm looking down at my phone. <laughs> please, please understand. I got to say that. I'm, I'm so very that... interested. I just want to, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just got to get there. Just got to save and share. And oh, my gosh. That is probably the quickest. Now we have 14. There that we is go. as quick as I've ever had people get into a string. That's uh, Scott deserves all the credit for that, by the way. <laughs> oh, we don't know That's nothing that. to do with either of us. <laughs> I'd, share it to, I'd share it to TikTok too, but unfortunately, all those kids are still in school right now, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't distract their, uh, their education. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, welcome everyone. I guess we don't have to pause that much if we already have this many people into the live stream. This is the Triple Horn Roundtable um, featuring myself, uh, Derek Wright, and then we have Scott. Hey, Scott. Hey, how's it going? And then Mark Houghton. Uh, could you say something, Mark? Sure. How's that? Should we all should we all should we all show our triple horn of choice here? Okay. Get these things. Right, yeah, this is this is my triple horn right here. <clears throat> uh, hmm, that's interesting. It, well, that's right, because I am the host of the meeting. I was just thinking it's never never seems to be switching to me in the screen, but it's highlighting me. So there you go. It'll it'll show us off. Okay. All right, so to start off, let's talk about the triple horns that we each have. Scott, would you like to talk about your horn a bit? Absolutely. So the uh, triple horn is made by Engelbert Schmid. Uh, in, uh, and this one was made in the Tiefenried factory. Uh, now his, uh, his workshop is in Mendelzell. And uh, it is the body of the horn is in gold brass and then the bell i have is a yellow brass hand hammered bell um basically i bought this horn i think i started playing it in 2018 um but the horn was made i think in 2006 i think it was one of the last ones that was made in the teeth and reed shop um it's a fantastic instrument i play it as my primary instrument and have since i bought it um taken many auditions on this horn won my job in louisville on this horn um, and have done a lot of other cool projects too. Most famously, it's the horn that is featured 
mostly in my uh, social media content that I make. So I use it to make all my arrangements and multi-tracks and videos and all sorts of stuff. And um, here is um, the listing for the horn that uh, Scott plays on our website. Uh, it is uh, quite expensive at uh, $8,259. <laughs> Uh, Engel Birchmint definitely, um, uh, definitely not cheap, but uh, extremely well made. We're doing a triple horn live stream, but we don't stock triple horns because mm -hmm. they're really expensive and people don't buy them that often. And usually, if you want a triple horn, you probably want it customized in some way anyway. You wouldn't want it stocked. So, for the most part, stop that share there. <coughs> Um, did you try any worth every penny? <laughs> and did you try any other um, triples when you were um, when when you uh, when you bought the your Heidi Fletch mid? Um, I had played on a uh, Hans Hoyer triple because uh, we had one in our studio at the at Yale, the Yale School of Music. So I played on that one. Um, I played on some F triples. Uh, from Engelbert Schmidt, so instead of the E-flat, the F version. Um, and really, I mean, honestly, when I went to buy it, I wasn't actually trying to buy a triple horn. I was trying to buy a descant. But as these things happen, uh, I, you know, I was looking for a high horn, played a whole bunch of different descant horns, Paxmans and, and, and Schmidts and Alexanders and things like that. But um, when I played this exact horn, this particular one, um, at the shop, I, I was like, you know, this is, I think this is the right move. And so I just kind of went with it as soon as I, as soon as I played it. This was the last one I tried. Cool. All right, Mark, do you want to talk about your triple a bit? Sure. Um, how far back do we want to go? Let's see. I mean, I, I've gone through a few different triple horns at this point, but uh, rarely has it been for any length of time my primary, uh, you know, what I what I call my daily driver instrument. I guess um, uh, I used to be principal horn in Fort Worth. Um, went through a spell there where I was playing uh, an Engelbert Schmidt triple. This was a B or sorry F B flat high F full triple, um, and that was the first triple horn that I really had any uh sort of time with um and uh with these things you know again it is i think you, you kind of alluded to it it's it's a pretty specialized tool um so that's why you know if, if there are students watching and students that will see this uh if you're a young student you really have no use for a triple horn generally there, there's no uh, i would say uh you know, it, it also builds character to to figure things out on a double horn. Um, but this is mainly for more dedicated uh, high horn uh, playing. For, generally, I think, um, you know, and there there are some exceptions. Um, but uh, so I was on an Engelbert Schmidt triple for a little while, um, which was a great instrument. Um, e flat or high F. That was that first one was a, a high F, uh, and Derek actually I think you ended up purchasing that horn uh, at some point down the the road. Yeah. Uh, so you played that one as well. That's, but I'll try and do a quick recap here. Um, so I was on that for a little while, uh, bounced around trying different things as you, as you do sometimes. You go through periods where you you try different equipment and and look for for results and what fits you and suits the ensemble best, et cetera. Uh, and then I actually ended up uh, a couple of years later uh, playing one just like Scott's. Um, and that was a great horn. I really enjoyed the, the E flat triple uh, from Schmidt and that was a Mendelzell horn. Um, and that was a really great instrument. And I must say that I kind that sometimes I kind of miss it. I sold it when I moved here um and it has since taken on a life and i believe it's being played somewhere in new york um at this point but uh the e flat uh 
high horn is really like kind of amazing because uh, it has so much a similar timbre to the B flat horn. So it's it's although it's not as short an instrument, so you're technically you know the I suppose the targets are not quite as large as, as on a high F uh, descant horn. Um, the uh, it's it's close enough being that step away that it feels like a high horn, and I feel like the sound is um, more similar to to the B flat horn. So. Uh, not to get too much in the weeds about that, but I do kind of miss that horn. And I, I, I still remember really great performances I had uh, on that E flat triple. And uh, it was, it was wonderful. Um, you know, since I, I moved here, um, it wasn't, it wasn't really my, again, my daily driver sort of horn. Uh, I play Rauk normally, and that just seemed to fit so well in the section and for being third horn, not having to play extreme high stuff very often, if at all, um, I really just stuck with my Rauk, and I do um, for for most things on most days. Uh, very recently, I did I purchased this uh, Paxman Heritage triple. It is a high F triple, full triple F B flat high F, and it's a really cool thing they've done here because they've brought back an old design so uh the the 75 uh original 75 model triple has this same wrap but it's actually very similar to uh the new patterson triple as well um uh, one key difference between the original version and the new heritage version the paxman is that you have triple bore so all of the the horns are um uh uh, different bore sizes to sort of uh, temper the uh, tone quality and the resistance quality between all of the horns. And I got to say, I really, I'm really enjoying this horn. Um, it, it fits really well when I, when I need it in our section, we have kind of a, a Paxman heavy high horn section. So Bill Caballero is on, again, the original, version of my horn uh, that, you, that you've seen there. So he has a very old 75 that is, uh, it's, it's seen a lot. It's, it's, it's seen a lot of uh, uh, use over the years, but he sounds unreal on that horn. And I, I don't really think he sounds the same on anything else. So I knew I wanted to kind of get as close as I could to match him. Uh, and I felt like this piece of equipment was great for that. Um, and Steve Kostiniak, our associate principal, is he just switched. Um, he has a Paxman double, Paxman full triple, but he just picked up a Paxman 80, uh, which is a compensating triple, and he sounds amazing on that horn. It's a real match for him and his, his style of playing. So I wanted to have something for certain weeks um, when I had touchy high entrances, and they come up now and again. Um, something that matched sort of the, the, the lineage of what the other equipment that was being played in Pittsburgh. And I think I found it. Um, so that Derek is a very long answer to your question. <clears throat> oh, no problem. Thank you for, thank you for going through it. Um, oh, and I should also show, um, Warhorn on our website. So it is um, here. Now this is a picture of the normal 75.3, not the 75.3 heritage, but the 75.3 and the 75.3 heritage is the same price, um, 16,895. So hey, if you're comparing it to the Schmidt, it's a deal. <laughs> um, Look at all the mouthpieces you can buy with those extra two thousand dollars. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, the um, the pa okay. <laughs> Sorry, okay there. Te technology things, but That's we right. are good. We, we are good. 
So I'm going to talk about my triple horn a bit. Yes. So if you follow these live streams, you know that last year I, uh, for a little bit, I was playing around with uh, Rico Kuhn Innovation Double, which was one of the best horns that I had ever played. Um, so when I was at IHS in August, I brought it with me. Um, I played a solo on one of the regional artist concerts. And uh, Rico Kuhn used that as an opportunity to launch his new innovation triple. Uh, and so he, he invited me to be a part of the, of the launch. There was a kind of a, a session that was specifically for launching the new innovation triple. Um, and I tried it and kind of instantly, instantly fell in love with it. So I took it home with me from the conference, um, sold the innovation double because I you know, could not afford to have the innovation double and the innovation triple. Um, and this is it. This is uh, a horn in high F, although this horn can easily be converted to E flat. Uh, and I have the E-flat set. So there are four slides in here. And if you replace the four slides on this instrument, it's converted to high E-flat. Um, we can talk more about that later. I don't wanna get into the weeds of high F versus high E-flat right now, but just know that I can switch this one. Um, it's really light, you know, Rico Kuhn's triples have been fairly popular for a while. What makes the innovation different is um, he's using a lightweight valve section, a thinner gauge of metal, lighter weight braces, which gets it more towards the weight of an Engelbert Schmidt triple. While the old um, Rico Kuhn, the regular 393X is more towards the weight of the Paxman triple which is, um, you can definitely feel it's heavier than, uh, than an Engelbert Schmidt triple. Um, the other things about the innovation is that it is triple bore. So like um, Mark's Heritage, uh, Mark's Heritage uh, triple, this is a, a triple bore horn. And it's, um, this one, lightweight triple bore, oh, and a more compact design. So it's just, the circle is smaller, so it is. Um, it feels a little better to carry and play, which is always a concern for triple horns because you never know uh, because they can be heavy, and if you're playing a long concert with them and it's not well balanced, it can be pretty taxing. Um, and I will show. The problem is when I am. <laughs> When I am doing the talk, I cannot stay in camera as I share my screen. <laughs> um, but the Rico Kuhn Innovation Triple is $15,995. Um, $15, um, versus the regular uh, Rico Kuhn 393X Triple, which would be uh, $14,995. Here we go. I like to type triple horns. And as you can see, we have quite a few triple horns available to look at on our site. Um, again, we don't stock them and won't be doing that anytime soon, but uh, they are available there for order. And many of them will come uh, fairly quickly. So this is the innovation triple here at um, 15995 it's also worth mentioning that we get a fair number um, of pre-owned consignment triple horns that come through. And sometimes they sit around for quite a while because, again, it's a rather specialized instrument. So um, it's not for everyone, but uh, if you're interested in, in, in uh, acquiring a triple horn, um, it's always worth looking at the pre-owned selection as well. Sometimes you can get really lucky uh with uh, uh maybe an older original paxman that if they don't that, you know that was a sort of a unique uh uh instrument and uh, they don't really exactly make that that same thing anymore so 
uh, worth kind of browsing to see what's what's on offer. Um, and actually, I was thinking about that when you were talking uh, talking about your F triple, because you had you had the F triple, and then I bought it and played it for a little bit, and I sold it off to a good friend of mine, uh, Google my man Freddie at uh, West Texas A and M, and he. Uh, about a year ago, decided to switch from the F triple to an E flat triple. So he got a new E flat triple from us and sold the F triple again on consignment. And it um, it sold at IHS this past summer. It was actually the very first horn um, to sell off of our booth. It sold within the first 15 minutes of the show. Um, a, a college age student came up. He was like, I want to buy this. And I was like, um, Okay, I was actually taken off guard because people don't usually buy like the first few minutes of the show. And he was like, I know what I want. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think your, 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 your old F triple has gone off to a very nice home. Um, yeah. So let's stop and take a, some questions here. We do have a few here. Uh, and the reason why we're live streaming this is that we really want your questions. So please keep asking. We have one from Angel Morales. I've always wanted a triple horn, but I see just as many professionals with double horns as I do with triple horns. What are the pros and cons to each? And in what setting would it be appropriate to use a triple horn? Sure. So, I mean, yeah, this is really the crux of the triple horn question, right? Is, is if they don't actually let you play any higher, uh, why play on them. If a double horn can do everything, why would you use a triple horn? And for me, I think, you know, the first thing that I consider when playing any horn is the sound. And it's a, it's, it's almost a, not, I wouldn't say a coincidence. I mean, because these horns are incredibly well made, but the Schmid sound was something I was looking for. Um, but the descant side of the horn is it offers more colors and more reliability in the high register that you don't always get with a double horn. Um, it makes the slots of the intervals wider, which allows you to sort of have more of a room to, to hit the note and have the note respond. But the consequence of that wider slot is that if you aren't centered, you can now play out of, you can play an out of center high note, uh, which might not, you, you might have just missed the note in the uh in a, on a double horn which is you know that's is that better or is that worse um and i think some other pros of it are options for fingerings i i joke all the time that having the high e flat horn is worth every single penny because i can play trigger two on high a and it's i there's no reason to use any other button to play high a um because it's so great and the a flat is e flat trigger one which is an amazing fingering for that note um, technically, intonationally, all those sorts of things. Um, but they are bigger. They're bigger instruments. They're heavier instruments. Um, in, in the same reason why I think Geyer's is a very lightweight um, sort of acrobatic horn um, are very prominent. The triple is going to take you in another direction to be a very big instrument that requires, you know, a, not only a lot of muscle to just lift it up and make sure you can play it with good ergonomics and good posture, um, but it does affect the sound in some way to have an instrument that's heavy. Do you have some? Do you have any other thoughts about the pros and cons? Uh, Mark, do you have any? Sure. Yeah, uh, those are great points, Scott. Um, and I agree, hundred um, percent. The uh, one of the big things for me is uh, I think there's always going to be some level of compromise, right? I mean, anytime you have uh, a lead pipe that you know is affecting uh, three different horns essentially um, you, you know you're gonna run into some issues there's some there's some interesting workarounds and some some ways that different makers have dealt with it and some deal with it better than others but um, my main just just personally my main, frustration sometimes with the triple horn is that I don't get the richness in the lower registers on the, the full, you know, low F horn. 
Um, I think that I, I mean, I've, I've really yet to play a triple horn that, uh, satisfies that way in the same way that a double does. But I will say that, uh, I had the Hill triple comes the closest of all the horns I've played. Good luck trying to find one of those. They're very, (laughs) basically, sorry. They're amazing instruments though. I, they're, Fat. We have we have a sub who plays with Louisville who brings hers and it's uh, every time she's there I'm like I can just give me like five minutes I just want to I just want to try it out because it's so good. It's it they're very good. I a uh, colleague Zach Smith, the assistant principal here, uh, has one and uses it for just about everything. Um, occasionally, if he's playing second or or something, he'll bring in something else, but. He's very happy with it. He's very comfortable on it. I've tried it, and I, I really can honestly say that was the closest I felt t- uh, to a horn being really a truly a double horn with the desk can on top of it. That was really the closest. Now, again, it's it's a very heavy horn. It's it's It actually felt, to my, and I don't have the weights in front of me, but it felt heavier than the Paxman that I'm playing. And... Uh, so there are, again, there are, there are compromises. It's a bigger instrument. Schmids are definitely the lightest. So, I mean, there's, there's something to be said for that. So if, if you're talk if you're primarily interested in keeping the weight down, I would say, look, look at a Schmid um, for that. And, and, you know, other, other positive reasons. Um, but, but anyway, back to the, what I feel is a compromise is certainly the low register of the horn uh, in most cases is going to be somewhat compromised. So you're, it's it's not even just the not even necessarily the decibels you're producing, but it's the feeling that you get, uh, the the feeling of sound resonating there. I, I the the density of sound, to me, the quality of, of density of sound, is a sort of uh, confidence builder, right? And and in a double horn, that's functioning the right way. I always get the sense that the energy transfer is is there in the lower registers. Um, I'm not sure that I feel the same way on, on most triple horns. Uh, and an, another thing that I wanted to point out, Scott, you were talking about fingerings, which I think is a great, um, is a great topic we could probably spend way too long on. But I also think it's worth noting that you can, uh, you can use uh, alto horn or high horn fingerings down in the pedal register sometimes and it's it's kind of amazing like there are certain response issues that uh, that you might struggle with on the low f horn of a double horn that you can you know you can you can use the 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 high f horn um it's to, amazing to get... on, on on brahms tragic overture yes yeah Brahms Stuff tragic like overture all yeah. one <laughs> Mahler, the the pedal F and Mahler one I use the E flat one and three combination so that I have a fingering sw- oh it's amazing it's the best thing yeah I mean it's it's almost it's almost a, a, a secret in a way because everybody thinks that you know there's a limit to the the alto horn but I mean and then there is to to some degree but but that's a that's a whole other you know category of use that people don't really associate with triple horns. Um, Let's see what else. Um, pros and cons. I think I'll probably think of something else. Uh, I guess before before I move on and to, you know let Derek take over on this. I uh, just the general feel of uh, sometimes the feel of resistance. And uh, I think Scott, what you were saying. I guess this comes to mind about centering on the high horn. Sometimes on the triple horn, I just feel that. Uh, there, there, I'm always a, a player that just, I appreciate resistance in an instrument. I feel like anytime I have more to blow against, there's a security there that I embrace. And it does take some time, I think. And I will say that with this, this Paxman heritage, the, the smaller bore on the higher horn does even it out somewhat. And it makes it a little more reliably, uh, resistant in the way that more, more in the way I would expect. Uh, and, um, and that's another advantage of the E flat triple is that you have a, a little, you know, it's being a lower horn, it's got a it's a little longer. And so it feels a little more resistant, but 
but yeah, that's, that's always something that um, can be a little off putting when you first learn to play a triple horn or a descant is you can't really, you don't really blow the same way into the high horn that you, that you do into the other, uh, the F and the B flat sides of the horn, if that makes any sense, you have to kind of, uh, there's a, there's a learning curve. There is a process, right? You can't really push it too much. Um, and you, you got to really listen for where the pitch is responding. Um, and that takes some time regardless of the make that you're, that you're playing on. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, Sorry, go ahead, Scott. Oh, no, I was just going to say that's, that's for me, that's evidence that um, that resistance that you're talking about is actually some of the reasons why I would choose not to use the high side of the horn, like the high B flat in Heldenleben, the opening excerpt. I mean, I, you would, I would almost never want to play that on the high side of the horn because that resistance gives that note its power in, in the extreme loud, loud playing, that, that ping, that brightness. Um, you, you lose some of that in the descant. Um, Beethoven seven is another example, but for something like uh, Haydn 31, for a lot of the Mozart and, Be and, and the earlier Beethoven symphonies, that uh, that kind of of high horn playing is actually in, incredibly characteristic of that music. And so it's it's those options that you know you're not using them to play high notes. I, I really do feel like you're using them to access both stability and color in that register and, and it's it's good to just have all those different parts in one instrument they're convenient at least to have them all in one instrument yeah and um it's funny you're talking about blowing differently into the high horn um on a side note this is why i always recommend recommend against people Using a desk cant in an audition, if they haven't had extensive <clears throat> experience playing a desk cant, a lot of people will, you know, go take a principal audition and they'll see, um, you know, box Brandenburg, a con uh, concerto one on there, the box B flat minor math, um, some stuff from Haydn, and they'll be like, okay, so this is definitely a, a desk cant would help me here, and I would say yes, a desk cant will help you, but trying to borrow a desk camp, practicing it for a couple weeks and then taking it to the audition is going to be disastrous. Um, like if you're going to use a desk camp in that situation, you've got to like get yourself a desk camp and then practice the desk camp every day, just, even just a little bit. You've got to learn how to play the desk camp. The triple horn is, um, the triple horn is the same. My triple horn, I feel like it has a, pretty decent low register uh, that's a learning curve that's differently as well the low register just takes a different blow um you can dump a lot more air into the low register on a double horn than you can on a triple horn um even my triple horn one of the advantages of one of the stated advantages of the rico kuhn triple horn is that it has a long lead pipe most other triple horns they have to um you know, if it's a high F horn or a high E flat horn, they have to have a shorter lead pipe than a double horn would normally have on those horns because it's just a compromise. You have to have a lead pipe that matches the that matches the shorter horn. On the Rico Kuhn triple, what happens is you have the taper that goes through here, and the taper actually continues through the change valve. And this tube going around here continues the lead pipe for the uh, F and B flat sides of the horn, while the uh, lead pipe for the high F side of the horns goes through this tiny tube here, and then ends here, which is also why it could be converted to E flat, because one of the slides that you change out to convert it to E flat um, is this slide, and you just put in a longer, E flat slide. So now you have a lead pipe that matches the E flat side of the horn versus uh, versus the F alto side of the horn. Um, that compromise does people can see, as I was saying before, it can lead to a stuffy low register. Um, I think it actually has a little bit more to do with the weight as well of the horn. Um, it's just more more mass to make vibrate. But it's something you can 
it's something you can overcome, but it takes it takes practice. You can't just pick it up and play it. All right, we have another question here. <laughs> Sorry. Is mankind ready for a quadruple horn? <laughs> you know, we could do it. Uh, the I guess like what because Paxman makes the B flat and then B flat alto horn. That... Right, Mark, you own that one, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I have the Descant version, B flat, high B flat, <laughs> and there is a very rare, and I forget the model number, but there is a very rare uh, F B flat, high B flat triple. It's a compensating. Paxman 101. Thing. Yeah, okay. We could, so, we could get there. I think we could do it. We could have an F, B flat, <laughs> F, B flat, quadruple. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it, I guess we had to expect that question. I mean, it's, it's a logical, <laughs> you know, conclusion. But, uh, yeah, I mean, at some point, I think taking into account all the compromises and all the metal, that, that seems... That seems like it's uh, over-engineered, to say the least, I guess. Well, I just imagine part of the training for playing that horn will be a daily gym visit working yeah. on upper body strength. You're going to have to put in a lot of reps in the gym. <laughs> plan going. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. that, I, um, one of the things I thought would be interesting to talk about, because we talked about a little bit, you know, where these differences between the horns, but when you, and, and you were saying, just when you're preparing for auditions or learning how to use it in general, you know, what did you guys do to start learning how to play the triple horn? Like what, what were some of the changes that you made in your playing and practicing to sort of figure this instrument out as a unit? Go ahead, Derek. Okay. So um, for me, I had to start off from a place of focusing on the sound. It is very easy to let, especially the high F, it's, if you're not paying attention to the sound, it's very easy to let it get away from you and to sound um, pretty honky and, and bad. Um, and as I said before, it's easy to let the low, ret, the low F horn just get really, really stuffy. So keeping, concentrating on keeping an even sound making sure the sound is open. And while doing that, doing a lot of uh, concone exercises, um, there's actually, everyone knows, everyone should know the concone book that's been transcribed for horn and um, trumpet. But if you go on IMSLP, you can find um, some of the original concone books for high voice. And you could take that and just play it in F. It's not written in F, just play it in F, um, as if it's written in F. Um, and that gets you some really nice practice on, on the high F horn while trying to remain lyrical and warm and having a great sound. Um, the other thing that you do is just play a lot of technical exercises, scales, arpeggios, Nothing special, but um, uh, I would go up and down a scale using the F and B flat horn. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, like I normally would for a double. And then you go up and down the scale again using, uh, you know, using the triple horn fingerings so that you don't forget, you don't become uncomfortable with the double horn feeling fingerings and you don't end up having to use the high F horn as a crutch that you can't get away from but you do get to learn a lot of the technique up there. Uh, Mark, did, did you do anything? Yeah, I mean, generally today, these days, I, I have the horn out all the time and I split my warm up time between my double horn and the triple horn. Most of the warm up and most of my daily routine takes place on the double horn, but I like to, um, uh, be sure and and mix some time on the triple horn in every day um, because I want to get a sense of transferring that same qualities that sorry rather that the qualities that I like on the double horn I'd like to see if I can 
bring those out in the triple horn and also the ergonomic differences when this is something that i should have mentioned before we're talking about pros and cons there with two thumb triggers there's always an ergonomic uh situation there i think um and there's there's it, it takes some getting used to uh the other the other aspect of that which we maybe want to circle back to is whether you stand the horn in f or b flat um, and there's there's uh, there's a whole discussion there, but let, let's come back to that in a second. Um, I think just regular for me, regular time uh, on on both instruments, meaning the triple horn and the double, um, is is how I sort of keep both working for me, um, and and appreciating the differences, you know. Um, uh but yeah i mean I, I feel like if i put in time um on the triple horn on a regular basis it's not such a surprise when i need to use it and you know it's it's not unfamiliar to me yeah that's i mean the time on the horn just getting used to it and and playing it is incredibly important. I, I was very lucky when I switched to this instrument, I was still, I was actually in the process of getting a DMA that I never finished at a, <laughs> the Yale School of Music. And so I was still studying with Bill Purvis at the time. Um, and Bill is, is I if I have my history correct, is one of the early adopters of the triple horn, especially the E-flat triple horn. Um, and so I was able to work with him, you know, every week, every day on this instrument and and figure out stuff. It became, I mean, what's, I think the secret though, that he really helped me figure out was that at least in my experience, when you are playing on a triple horn almost exclusively, you really treat the instrument as a single B flat horn uh, and with a button that lets you get some low notes out easier and a button that lets you get some high notes out easier. But the majority of your playing, you're sort of operating as if it's a single B flat instrument. And so I kind of did a lot of my, I relearned Koprosh using a uh, B-flat horn kind of mentality, B-flat horn sound, um, Maxime Alphonse, like all those really early things I did, you know, eight years earlier, going back to those, but now kind of not worrying about the F horn so much and focusing on a B-flat instrument really helped. All of the lip slurs that you already do on the natural harmonic series, extending those up to using the high horn, same exercise. Any exercise I did that used natural harmonics, um, just continuing those up into the high register to learn how to use the, the high side of the horn was really invaluable. Um, and then one thing I did also was, I was playing on a West Hatch Geyer horn. And so I think I recorded, like when I bought the horn and I started that semester, I recorded like a number of excerpts and and solos things that i thought would be good to know on both instruments like it's strauss concertos uh, adagio allegro things like that and um recorded them on the hatch and then didn't play the hatch for like two months and then sort of just referenced those recordings as i was learning the um the triple to kind of see where my sound was going and if if it was getting too far away from what i thought was my best sound on the old horn um, and it was it was an interesting exercise because it, by the end of it, I was like, oh, wait a minute. My sound actually wasn't really that good on the other horn. <laughs> I like this new one better. Uh, but, you know, it was still good to have those comparison recordings so that I was never getting so far away from my education and my fundamentals that I, I couldn't like grab that sound back if I needed to on the new instrument. Um, and then also trying out like hundreds of mouthpieces to figure out, <laughs> which, you know, it's its own rabbit hole. Um, but I think I, I, I bought, when I switched, I changed to the, Schmid makes his own line of mouthpieces. So I just switched both at the same time. I just started playing on Schmidt's mouthpiece and Schmidt's horn. That way, I don't know, it just felt like I was getting into that world very deeply and then I could adjust it after I f had sort of orientated myself and, and triple horn land. Yeah, the I mentioned my earlier foray into triple horn playing. I stood my horns in B flat also with that same mentality. And it makes a lot of logical sense because just as you said, if you operate 
from the standpoint that you're going to be using the B flat horn the most often, and then you know looking to extend from there when needed. Uh, and and this is the European mentality of standing the horn in B flat. It's very common for double horns, you know, players in Europe to do this. Um, and and I you know for me I you know going through all the scales and and different exercises and learning to, you know, it, it, it's, if you watch Stranger Things, it's like the upside down, you know, it's, it's totally, for me, it was, it was doable to some degree, but um, when I would get burned is a passage uh, in the mid register of the horn. Sometimes when I'd go to, to play something, it would be maybe on a pop show or something. Um, just a noodly semi-chromatic thing taking place in, you know, uh, bottom of the staff or middle of the staff. And it would just, it would just kill me. So uh, now with this one, uh, uh, with this new Paxman triple I'm playing, I do have it just standing in, in low F and I use it more like a double with a descant. Um, and I think there are, you know, obviously you got to make your own decision on that. Uh, it does take a significant amount of work to to orient yourself the other way, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I think you could make the case for for either. The other thing that I noticed is that in my section in Pittsburgh, all of those folks that are we've got three players playing triple horn. No, so I guess if I'm in, if I bring mine in, we've got four in the section that play triple horns. Uh, but again, I'm I'm not a not an everyday triple horn guy um but i consulted with all those guys and they all stand their horn in, in f and, and so they all kind of operate it that way and i figured okay i'm mean, also you know there's precedent there so maybe i'll i'll just try this and i it it does to me make the switch a little easier initially now whether or not i can maximize things you know in another way uh that remains to be seen, I guess. But that that does, you know, again, that that's a big learning curve. If you've ever if you've ever switched your trigger, uh, that would be a fun exercise just to see if those of you who who haven't done that. And and actually Scott, I have a question for you now because we were talking about you also play in 8D sometimes. Do you now play that standing in B flat as well? Uh, no. So I don't know if you've ever seen this video, but there was a viral video years ago where they they did the bicycle thing and they they these people engineers made a bicycle where the handlebar tilts the opposite way to get the bike to turn. Um, and they found that after people had done that experiment, it took them like, you know, it took them like 10 minutes to get oriented to the new position. But then every single time they switched, it took less and less time to get used to the other way until people could go back and forth. And that's actually how I feel now um that like uh, you know two years ago like yeah it was it was a real pain to like when i when i learned the below the etudes i recorded the eight below the etudes on my youtube channel and like learning those on this triple horn especially it's in f every single one's in f major they're all in that mid register it was a nightmare trying to get all those fingerings to work. um but then uh after i had done that you know, it was, I could pick up any horn and switch. We used to play this game at New World, which definitely was pre-COVID, uh, <laughs> where we would do an excerpt like a like, uh, 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 Russian roulette, so to speak, and you would, you know, spin a bottle or spin something, and you had to play an excerpt on whoever's horn you landed on. And I had, That's a, fun. I had an insane advantage in that game because <laughs> I could go back <laughs> to everyone's... Uh, everyone's f double horns you know and and play things fine and then they would have to play on my triple with the fingerings backwards and it's like well you know sometimes sometimes you just have an advantage that's life that's <laughs> I, don't know awesome. that game, I don't know if that game was actually helpful in preparing for any auditions but we had a good time we had a good time i th i think it sounds pretty good actually that met uh it gives me some ideas for things to do with my students um but it, it, that also brings to mind the the ergonomic factor too of when you stand the horn be it any horn really when you stand the horn in b flat uh this is the other element that by not clamping down on the thumb valve as often your hand is looser 
right? Like you, you're you're not using as much effort generally. So I, I mean, I think there's something to that. I mean, there really is. Almost never yeah, I, I go from <clears throat> the high side, so that motion doesn't come up very often if you sit the right, way, which is very comfortable. Sorry, Derek, you were saying something. Oh yeah, I was I was gonna say yeah. I'm actually my horn is currently standing in F. And I'm actually finding that technically to be a, a pretty big impediment. Mm -hmm. um, I um, about a month ago I played um, high part on um, West Side Story. It was one of those. I'm sure your orchestras have done it too, where they put up a movie on the screen behind you and you play you, you play the soundtrack. It's become all the rage. They're fun. But West, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but West Side Story is very technically um uh, it's it's technically challenging and i found rolling back and forth to be um to be really difficult um and i play some other um very technically challenging things too especially um when i'm playing in like a wind ensemble setting um this summer after late may i don't have much of my schedule um so as my last concert of the season is done, I plan on switching my horns to B flat and spending the summer learning how to do it. So I'll report back to see how has it been a success or failure. Coprot is um, a good place to start. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but yeah, we have we have questions piling up here. So let's um Keep going here, and thank you for the questions and comments. Please keep them coming. Um, for we have uh, from VT for someone who typically plays low horn. Do you think a triple is worth the price? Uh, Derek, that seems like a question for you because as a high horn player, I do not know the answer to this question. I I okay. play Shostakovich five like you know, every once in a while, and that's about as low as I try to go. <laughs> I would say typically no. Now, I do know some um, low horn players, most notably former fourth horn of the Dallas Symphony, Paul Capehart, he played um, he played a Schmidt triple, um, Schmidt E flat triple. Um, but for low horn in general, you're not going to need the advantages of a triple. Uh, and this actually kind of leads me into the next question here, which I'm going to combine. Well, actually, it's a question a few a few down here uh, from Angel Morales. He says, on most days, my high A to high C are all right. But when I practice music that has me playing in that range consistently, I'm uh, in um, parentheses, he says, I'm playing Telemann Concerto in D. I chop out rather quickly. Would I be limiting myself if I use a desk cant? Or would it be, uh, he says, helping me, but I have a feeling he meant hindering me. Um, if you're, in a lot of cases, it's really much better. And actually, I would say for most people, it's better to go the double and a desk cant route. Because when you're playing something like Telemann that's very high, it's not just high, it's very light. Uh, it has a different character. And uh, the triple horn, although you can work and you can get that lighter character when using the high horn, it's frankly, it's just a lot easier to use a descant. Uh, this is my descant horn. This is Paxman Heritage. 45 descant, so basically the descant version of the triple horn that uh, Mark is using. For one, this horn is just really, really light. It's basically a single B flat horn with another smaller horn stuck on it. So it's much lighter than, than any double you would find. That helps it to get a light sound. Um, a lot of the bore is just smaller. Like you can just look at the tubing and tell, okay, that's a smaller diameter there. It It's gonna be much easier to be light and floaty and technical on something like the Telemann Concerto or uh, a lot of music from the Baroque era and early classical era. And because of that, I'm say, I, I would say if you're interested in 
exploring that kind of music, but typically a low horn player, your better call is probably to go out and find a good desk can. Now, a lot of good desk cans are pretty expensive. This desk can, for example, I believe it's, I'll double check when I'm not talking, it goes around $13,000. Um, and you can find a lot of used desk cans out there, usually Paxman desk cans, older Paxman desk cans, which is a great option. Um, you can find good we, one of the- We get a lot of those actually. Six to 7,000. Um, <clears> yeah, we, we actually have several, uh, uh, several used uh, Paxman desk cans for sale now. But um, that is, that's really the route I would rec recommend. That's a very yeah, long answer uh, please, to, that, to, to that question. Please don't attempt tell a long concerto on a double horn unless you absolutely have to. Yeah, you have that's been... a rough one. That's a, that's a cruel punishment. I mean, at least take, if you have to play a double horn for that, take the slides, they yeah. take the F slides out. You have our permission commenter to <laughs> to play it on a desk yet there's yeah there, it's funny there's you know there are a lot of pieces where the a desk can is perfectly fine and if you you have the the um the double and the desk can you can switch back and forth i find the pieces where you really need 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 is a strong word here but the triple is very beneficial um i find it mostly useful in the big strauss pieces um like heldenleben alpine symphony especially to get that last solo um especially if your conductor wants the high d uh at the end of it uh and uh that piece uh we did we did john adams harmony lara that was a very great one to have a triple for because those those quiet slurs where you need to get up to the high c and kind of maneuver around very lightly is a good one to have um and there's actually some pieces where the desk can't Limp, like it, it, it works, you can do it, uh, but you actually do end up in some uncomfortable spots. If your desk can't doesn't have an F extension, the Ravel Piano Concerto actually has a couple notes that you would prefer to give to the second horn player because the uh, the the low F sharp and the low G aren't super great on a lot of desk can't horns. So there are a couple of situations like that where it does help to have the full low F side of the triple. I mean, that's kind of, I think that's really where the difference is, is if you're going to use a double or a descant horn or anything like that, it's if you still need the full low F horn, you a triple is probably a preferred option for that. Otherwise, if you have one, a descant's going to do just fine. Yeah, it actually uh, reminds me of uh, talking to Bill Caballero, and he mentioned the first time that he used that Paxman triple that he's currently still on many, many years ago, he had to play um, uh, Salome without an assistant. And it was just that sort of, you know, getting through that whole opera in one piece, especially not having an assistant. Um, he picked that horn up and he hasn't put it down since. So that was the, you mentioned big Strauss pieces and that was the one that sort of sent him down, down the road of, you know, the, the triple horn universe uh, and uh, been there ever since. And we, we've all been talking about like orchestra kind of stuff, but there are, I think if you're a soloist too, if you play a lot of solo concertos and, and you do recitals and things like that, there are a lot of modern pieces where a triple horn is incredibly useful. Uh, Oliver Newson's horn concerto might as well have been written for a triple horn, although I think, T I don't know if Tuckwell did it on his Holton, uh, but whatever he did it on, he sounded great. Um, Benjamin Lees has a really great concerto that actually uh, Cab Bill Caballero recorded, I think, um, that uh, triple horn sounds, is incredibly useful for that piece. Um, and all sorts of the I did the Gunter Schuler Sonata a while ago, and having a triple horn to play that was just so so useful to make the the fluidity in the high register just that much that much easier and lets you really focus on it. You know, for me, it, it takes away the stress of some of those incredibly high notes and lets you just focus on making great music. Um, so it's not yeah, you know, you're not trying to hit the notes anymore. You're trying to just use the tool to make make the music come out. Yeah, and a lot of using a triple is really just about a confidence boost. <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to admit it. 
<laughs> no, don't tell them that. Of, don't tell them. <laughs> it's no hard. A, yeah, I know. There's a lot of confidence in putting down that trigger. It's just like, hey, that B, that high B flat is going to come out. Um, um, so we have a um, few other questions here. Uh, Mike Jones, I've heard that um, triples are used for A and above. Could you use a triple horn at the top of the staff, F and G, for example? Would that help? I play first horn with love, more clarity, and accuracy. I use high F on F and G all the time. What about you guys? <laughs> sure. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh the Queen Mab Scherzo and Berlioz, I play the entire excerpt on the E flat horn. Every single note. Uh it just works that way. Uh Ravel G major piano concerto, all the G's on the high on the high E flat horn. Um, but then there's plenty of examples where I don't do that at all. Um, where it's just not it's not necessary. So again, it's not I mean, even the double horn doesn't work this way, although I understand where it comes from. There is no point at which you switch. You don't say, okay, after, uh, you know, G sharp on the low in the staff and G sharp on top of the staff is where you push the trigger down. All fingerings, there's no such thing as an alternate fingering for me. There is just the fingering that is the best for the sound I'm trying to make. And triple gives you more options. There's even, we were talking earlier in the live stream, the, the, um, in the Schubert octet, the ba ba -dee da da, playing the first low G on the E flat horn is it actually helps a lot. It helps get you through all three octaves of that G. And ironically, you use the the B flat horn for the top G. If you do that, you don't use uh, the E flat horn for that. So every as as my teacher Bill Purvis would say, everything is everything all the time. It's just these are just options that you have to access. And um. I, I guess the better way of putting it is the only rule is sound good. <laughs> the only rule Does is it sound, sound good. good. Is it in tune? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> All right. We have um, from Donald Spaulding. Do any of you miss playing a double? Was it worth all the time to get used to it? I think this is definitely for you, Scott, because I think both me and Mark <laughs> play doubles all the time. So... <laughs> Well, I'm employed, so I think it was worth it. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's my the the. I'll tell you, I can tell you the exact moment where I uh, I decided to make the switch a hundred percent because I had taken an audition, a high horn principal audition, and I had made the finals, and I, it was the first time I had ever made finals, and I was like, well, I got to prove that this isn't just the horn, right? Like, I got to make sure that this is not just because I have a triple horn. So I took a second horn audition at a big orchestra, and I made the finals in that on the triple as well, using not using a double horn. And as soon as I had finaled at a low horn audition, I was like, I'm done. Triples are my horn for a while. Uh, I'm going to commit to this. Um, but I do, I, I mean, I keep, I have a Con 8D that I use as a double horn. I use it in my content sometimes. I use it to teach mostly. And um, part of that is because I don't, while I love the triple horn, I think it's a super interesting design. It's a cool instrument. I love playing on it. It's just fun. It's like that Simpsons meme where it's just like, I just think it's neat. You know, I just think it's neat. Um, but I do keep the double around because when I'm teaching, when I'm trying to connect with audiences that don't have access to that horn, I want to be able to make sure that I'm always uh, relevant and in that world to them. So I don't always use it in um, in the orchestra at my at work, but I do use it at home when and when I'm teaching. Um, so I haven't left it completely, uh, but I uh, probably won't use it in the concert hall for uh, for a while unless. Unless I have a in a week where I really am just trying to have a good time on a double again. Oh, thank you. Um, we have another question. We have a question from Benedict. Should you buy a news or a used horn? The answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's really about. Um, it's not just triple horns, doubles, descants, all of that. If you can find a a good used horn, that's good to buy. 
Um, you need to find a horn that's best for you. Not worry so much about new or used. If you're buying used, you do have to worry about are the valves tight? Is the compression good? Frankly, a lot of older horns have bad intonation. It's not because they're older. It's because the techniques used to test and build the horns weren't as advanced. Like I have a 1952 Geyer style horn that I love the sound of, but I rarely play it because it's horribly out of tune. So in a way, it's <laughs> kind of a, a, a museum piece at this point. Um, you, so you just have to watch out for like the condition of a horn. You know, is the metal thick in all places or is it thinning out? Um, you know, and a lot of people do make that mistake. They find a used horn online, especially if it's being um, bought private party. A lot of times using a shop, we evaluate the horns beforehand. We do a big checklist and we test things out before we send it to you. Um, if you're just buying from somebody, the seller, and I'm not even saying that the seller of a horn is deceiving you. He may not know all of the issues that the horn may have. He, he may not know that, oh, this horn lost a lot of compression years ago. And then if you buy it and you're especially an inexperienced player, you might think, oh, this horn blows so nicely. It's so free blowing. Um, and then someone else gets it and they're like, um, you're sagging on all of the notes. And it's because there's a hole in your horn. Uh, that kind of thing does happen. So I guess you can uh, compare it to buying a used car. Like there's nothing that should stop you from buying a used car as long as it's in good condition and has been um, well cared, cared for. Does anyone have anything they want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think my take is always just that you should be able to buy the instrument that you're trying so like whether that's new or used, I think isn't as important as if you are, you can play that exact instrument that you're going to be purchasing. There's very few manufacturers where I would buy a horn sight unseen um, and just have it shipped to me brand new, um, just because even, even little differences can make a big impact on how it plays and it could feel different. And you could have a lot of, you know, just it, it's some, if you can play the exact horn that you're buying, uh, it, it feels like a much more comfortable purchase to me. Um, that said, though, there are a lot of there are a lot of people who make custom horns that will do a lot of customizations for you if you're buying it new and you're involved in that process. You just also have to wait uh, sometimes years uh, to get those horns. So I've bought and sold horns through you guys, and I've always found it to be a really great and easy process. And it's it's so good to know exactly what you're getting and the history of the instrument. And the valve compression, even though I probably didn't know what that meant when I started this, <laughs> but you all make it very easy. So I, I, and you've also, you know, you've kept me away from some horns too that you that you felt like weren't at the quality that that you wanted to sell them at. Well, well, well thank you for that. Um, most triple and descant horns, actually. Yeah, most. Most triple descant horns that you buy are going to fall under that category of being made by a custom maker who will customize it for you and and, and work with you. Um, even if you're buying it through us, the maker will still work with you to get it um, to get it perfect. Because as I've said multiple times during this stream now, we don't stock new triple horns, and nobody does, um, because they're really expensive, and it's a really specialized tool. So if you're going to buy a new triple horn, you are probably going to be buying it sight unseen. Um, so you'll have to, you know, that's the advantage of working with a custom maker, though, because if you get it and there's something you don't like about it, you can always, um, you can always work with them. Um, okay, did you have anything to add, Mark, to that? Not really. I mean, I think you guys covered it. Um, okay. I have, so, uh, I've played mostly used horns my whole life. So I don't know what that says about me, but, uh, this, <laughs> in fact, this Paxman triple is one of the rare new horns. In fact, all the triple, I guess it's to your point, all the triple horns that I have purchased have been new and the double horns I have played have been used. So again yeah there's just they're more specialized there's not as many floating around i think um 
nothing wrong with a, a great used horn. Yeah. Except for my guy, or I think my horns have been new. My regular double is a Madeline. Um, that was purchased new from Jacob. Um, my desk cat is, was brand new. Um, and yeah, my triple was brand new. Um, all right. Um, David Cetera. Uh, sorry, I, I probably have um, butchered your name. So apologies. What about the new triple Finca Dirk Fair Cornford? Is it possible to know more about these horns? Thanks a lot. So I can't speak to all of these horns. The Finca, the new Finca is um, a vast improvement over the old Finca triples. The, the, new, the new Finca 75 is a great horn. And as you can tell by that model number, um, which horn it was unofficially inspired by, it's, it's, it's uh, it's pretty much uh, a Pax. It's built like a Paxman triple, but using Finca's techniques. So Finca uses uh, composite valves instead of metal valves, which takes a ton of the weight off of the horn. Um, he, I believe, he uses thinner um, metal stock than Paxman as well. So the Finca becomes a. You know, we were saying Engelbert Schmidt's are the most lightweight triples, but actually, I think Finca makes the most lightweight triple due to the composite valves. Um, I, I can't say much more about the Finca. It's a great horn. I've played it multiple times. One of the best triples I've ever tried. Um, the Dirk um, Abiturnum does a decent triple as well. Uh, it's, um, let me be frank, it's a little heavy for my taste. Um, but if you don't mind a heavier horn, that's good. And I don't know anything about the fair or the cornford. Uh, any comments? The uh, the fair has made a they make a compensating triple. I think that's getting kind of popular in New York. Actually, um, there's a couple of people in the Philharmonic who use it. Um, really interesting instruments, um, especially for a compensating uh, triple that still feels like a full horn. Very good. And then one that wasn't on this list that I think is worth also knowing about is Patterson's triple horns, which are, um, to me, feel like if this is analogy is carries, they feel like a, a, a real American sounding triple horn. They, they have the same general vibe as like old Connie D kind of playing um, that sound concept to me is really built into the design of the horn so when you play one as if it were one of those old elkhart connie d's you um you sort of access a lot of how the instrument works and they use them in fittingly in the met opera uh tends to be where you see a lot of patterson triples um and there's some other places there so yeah those are those two i think those are the two brands i although i i also cannot say i know anything about uh comfort horns at all uh but i thought i would add the uh, the patterson to that list there Any comments, Mark? Yeah, I haven't played. Um, I haven't played the latest Finca. I haven't played the Cornford or the Fair. Uh, yeah, so I, I do. I do agree that Patterson is is uh, is in there and worth a worth a look if you're in the market. Um, so that's about. I think you guys have a little more uh, experience with those than I do. All right. Um, I think that is it for the um, for the questions for now. Um, were there any other? Well, did, have we talked about high E flat or high F yet? I guess we haven't. We've uh, slightly uh, uh, admitted it, it exists, but I don't know if we've gotten into it a yes. little. So I actually I. I mentioned that my horn could be converted to E flat and that I bought the E flat slides. Uh, I did try switching and playing it with the E flat slides for a while. Uh, what I like about the what I like about the E flat horn the most is that the fingerings are very, very intuitive. Um, you know, in some way you might think it's harder because you know the high F fingerings are gonna be pretty similar to uh, low F fingerings, just two octaves up. But the high, 
like moving between the high B flat and high B flat horn, there's just a a lot of really, really great fingerings to use that just make things just make things easier, make things smoother. Um, and the sound of the high E flat horn does match the high sound of the uh, of the B flat horn much more. So it makes the instrument overall a just more even sounding beast. However, the the reason why I went back to high F is um, the high F the high F is a lot easier to play on a lot of the high notes, and especially if you're trying to get a lighter. If you're trying to use the high F horn to get a lighter sound, a lighter lighter feel on some music, it's going to be much easier to do that rather than on the high E flat horn. I really think it's it, it's truly a personal decision. I don't think that there's one answer, uh, one right answer over the other. Um, any comments about that, Scott? Um, yeah, I think the... I love the E flat horn. I think it's just, it's so, it's to me, the design of the instrument to have it separated by fourths is integral to how the double horn functions evenly and how you can switch between the two of them. So I find that the same switch from B flat to E flat is um, also really important. Um, not that the Fs don't have their, uh, their uses. For example, um, the high E above high C, uh, might as well not exist on the high E flat horn. Sorry, people who uh, <laughs> who are hoping that that was useful, but it's just not a great note on that horn. It's that tritone. It's the tritone above the the fundamental of the pitch, so it's just not a great note. So if you're using it for like domestica or concert stuck, I would need to get a different horn just for that note specifically. It just doesn't really sound that great on the high E flat horn. And high B can be a little bit tricky on the E flat horn too. You have two options for fingerings. Um, but it's not always super like easy to use. Think of like um, what, what's the the comparable note is like how F sharp is squirrely on B flat horns, like the high B is squirrely on E flat horns. So um, it's not it's not a perfect design, um, but I do think that the keeping the lower sound and still having access to those high notes that are easier than the B flat horn, um, more accessible is to me, very valuable. I, I like it a lot. It's just that, yeah, if Concert Stuck comes up, if Domestica comes up, if uh, some other piece of the high E unit comes up, you might be uh, Haydn, what's the Haydn Symphony that has the F in it? Like, yeah, maybe you're gonna need to get even a smaller horn. Um, but for 99.9999% of playing, it is, it is perfectly equitable to the high F side. Any comments, Mark, that you, you've used both high F and high E flat as well? Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of what uh, what both you guys were saying about the, the fingerings being a little more intuitive, especially just right above the staff. They're more similar to B flat horn fingerings. Uh, I do like the feel in terms of the resistance better on, on a longer instrument. So there's a lot to like. I mean, like I said, I'm, <laughs> I really miss, I, I kind of, you know, some days I, I wish I hadn't sold that uh, Schmidt high, flat, high E flat triple. Um, I couldn't really justify keeping it either and having all the horns that I have because my my wife would probably leave me. But, uh, you know, it's it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, again, like it's a personal decision. Um, I think it makes sense, uh, uh, you know, for, for certain players in certain situations, um, you know, to take either route, but definitely both have their advantages. All right, let's finish up the questions that I had here. We don't seem to have any more questions coming um, coming through. And people are probably getting tired of us talking. We were at a peak of 40, 40 viewers for a while. Hey, there you go. But now we, yeah, now, now we've dropped down the 20. <laughs> Um, are triple horns the future of horn playing? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think if they, my, my thing is, if they really made it that much easier with no compromises, every single high horn player would be using one right now. And you just don't see that. Uh, people don't win more auditions if they use a triple horn. 
uh, everybody who's currently in the job doesn't necessarily use a triple horn. So they are specialized equipment. They are a personal preference thing, um, but they are not, they're not going to take over just yet. Um, they, they still offer some disadvantages. Um, and they are, they are in some ways a luxury. They are not necessary to do the job. Yeah. Well Pardon? said, I agree. I mean, I can't, I can't say it better than that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess most, even in like top orchestras, most principal horns still use doubles. There are many that don't. I can name several that use triples exclusively. I can name several that use triples often, but the majority still use doubles. So no, I don't. I don't think triple horns are the feature of horn playing. I don't think they're going away either, but not the feature. And uh, we talked a little bit about triple versus descant. Uh, at least I did. Uh, Scott, you, you don't own a descant, right? Oh, no, <laughs> I don't. I don't. Uh, I tried it once. Uh, I didn't. My my other. By the way, the other reason for having a triple instead of a double descant combo is kind of my situation, which is um, if you horns are very expensive, uh, and if you cannot afford to own two horns, it can be cheaper to own one horn. Uh, that, uh, you know, and especially because I was able to get my my triple used, I was able to save some money on it, and then I sold my my uh, my uh, my right other horn to help pay for it. So it, you know that that's one benefit. And I think there's also I know I talked to another horn player who said that he switched to um, triples exclusively after nine eleven because once the security was increased and they limited the number of bags you could take on airplanes, it was harder to travel with two horns. So he switched to a triple so that he could um, just travel with one horn for all the, the soloing and things that he needed to do for that. Um, so there's, you know, there's, those are not necessarily musical considerations, but they're not, they're not irrelevant uh, considerations either. Yeah. All right. Um, and Elia and Mark, when, when do you decide to use your triple versus your Paxman B flat, um, high B flat combo, or as I like to call the horn trumpet combo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, truth truth be told, I mean that that's a that Paxman B flat soprano horn is a pretty uh, rarely used instrument. Um, I, I I would use it like any any time I would use a descant really, you know. Um, but I suppose that it changes things now that I have the triple. So if we were to play like Queen Mob or something, I'd probably just use the triple right now. Um, if I had to play Brandon Burke Concerto as first horn, if I had to play Telemann Concerto or Concertstück, I'd use the the B flat soprano horn. Um, it, and I, in fact, I have played Concertstück on that um, once uh, before before I got the job here, and it was a significant help i'll put it that way um but generally i mean that's that's a pretty a pretty unique instrument a pretty extreme version of of a desk camp i guess you know because you're talking about something that, that where the high horn is the length of a trumpet and i was really surprised actually at how um uh not trumpet like it sounds uh, I was, it was, I mean, it's, it's legitimately, it still has a horn sound. Uh, and, and again, you think in your immediate thought is, well, this is going to be, everything's going to be cake. This is going to be so easy. Right. And, uh, certainly the targets are very big up there above the staff, but, but it, it takes just, just as we were discussing with, uh, high horns generally, you know, um, it's it, it to learn the feel and the blow and the response. It takes some time. It's it's not an immediate fix for all of your problems. Um, but uh, actually, it, it, to you know, so so basically, I guess I would use the 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 B flat B flat for for anything that's really extreme. Um, and I think that that's it's fairly limited in some regard. Um, 
And uh, it's not a horn that if I was playing in a larger orchestra, I don't think it would fit nearly as well. I think it's more of a soloistic or chamber type instrument. Yeah, it's very. All right. Let's just don't come up that often. But when they do, you want to have something that can they can get you get you there. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad to have it. I mean, I don't I don't um, play it that often. But it's another one that I'll 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 break out every once in a while. Sometimes just just to just for fun, you know, just to practice and 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 you know play some high excerpts on. And I think it's it's. Sometimes it's, I mean, this is very, it's, it's a luxury in a way uh, to, to have the option of playing a couple different horns, but it also, for, for someone who's seasoned in, in a job, sometimes it's just a great release and an inspiration to play something a little different. You know, sometimes when you're, you know, at the end of the season, when you're, you're feeling burned out or unmotivated, pick up, you know, uh, pick up a horn you don't play that often and just do something different. Uh, it can, it can kind of reignite something that, you know, maybe wasn't there. Yeah. But, you know, mixing it up, the advantages of mixing it up can't be, um, can't be understated. And, um, frankly, it's much less destructive to mix up the horns rather than, you know, mix up mouthpieces though. I'm oh, sure. don't all, all the other mouthpieces. mouthpieces. <laughs> I'm going to change mouthpieces today, just because you said that. I'm going to try. Something. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like we need to. Uh, that sounds like a whole whole other live stream. A whole different live stream. <laughs> yeah, I change everything. I'm gonna... I would say I'm surprised no one asked this question. But as far as mouthpieces for triples, I don't think you. Re um, I don't think you really need to look for a specific high horn mouthpiece to um, to match with a triple. Um, I would just I would just go with um, something medium, medium deep, middle of the road should be should be great. Um, maybe avoid like a super deep like Giardinelli C one or. You say that. Um, but Probably the most famous triple horn player in the New York Philharmonic, you know, used absolutely massive mouthpieces uh, to play that. You know, that so for every, that, that, every that's a good point. Like, and, and yeah. but then on the other spectrum, you know, Bill Vermeule in Houston uses a very small mouthpiece. So it's yeah, everyone's mm -hmm. just figure out whatever works for you. The horn doesn't doesn't really change mouthpiece choice that much. Yeah, yeah. The yep. role is sound good. Okay. Were there any last? Thanks. We we don't have any more questions though. Our um, our viewership has uh, went up for some reason again. Uh, any last thoughts that anyone would like to interject? I I'll leave I'll leave it with this analogy, which is if you've read Harry Potter and you remember the very first book, the uh, the Mirror of Erised, which is a mirror that can only give you what you desire or no it had a, it had a spell on it that it could only give the sorcerer's stone to somebody who wanted the stone but didn't need it and that is the triple horn you <laughs> can use a triple horn if you want one but you do not need it and that is if you feel like you need it uh coprush is probably a more effective and cheaper tool <laughs> buying a triple horn is at least my thought yes <laughs> mark last thoughts yeah i mean in that in that same vein um it's always better to tend towards the neurotic meaning the problem is more more than likely you and not the horn <laughs> so i would i would just say i think that's a healthier perspective generally in life for everything <laughs> but also applies to instruments in this case. Um, you know, if, 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 there's, uh, if there's any extra work you can be doing to, on the equipment that you have, uh, do that first. Don't, don't go out looking for equipment to solve your problems because it usually doesn't end well. I say that as the owner of a horn shop, by the way, which is a little <laughs> bit ironic, but 
but I really believe that I can't, I can't, uh, I can't be disingenuous about that. It's, it's just the truth. I mean, it's very true. You know, people switch mouthpieces, people switch horns, but I find that the best players, even if they're, even if they like to see what's out there and they try different equipment, what they tend to, they always, if there's a problem, the first question they ask themselves is, what can I do differently? You know, rather than what equipment do I need to change to, um, to get this to work? And with that being said, my last parting thought is buy horns at Houghton Horn. So we've recently done a, uh, a little bit of a facelift on our website to make it easier to um, easier to find what you're looking for, easier to find different categories of instruments, and easier to tell which ones are special orders and which. Oh, I did. Did I start this? I didn't share. Here we go. Okay. There we go. Um, so we've done a uh, facelift on the website to make to show um, make it easier to find out what. Um, what you want, like compensating horns, desk end horns, triple horns, marching horns, etc. Easier to tell what's in stock or not. So you clear special order badges or in stock ready to ship badges. Currently, as you see on this page, we have many desk end horns in stock. Um, so you could try Holton, Paxman, Alex, and multiple Alexanders here right now. Um, well, actually, I did not know that someone bought that Con 12D, but it is it is sold out. Um, and on the triple horn side of things, we have nothing that is currently in stock. We have a bunch of special orders that you can initiate. So horns from um, Hans Hoyer. Uh, which is the most expensive triple horn you can buy at twenty thousand um, dollars? You can buy buy that or route. Uh, <laughs> we have um, relationships with Paxman, very close relationship with Paxman, where we can work with you on um, um, on custom ordering you a horn, whether that's the regular seventy five, which is pictured here. Or the Heritage 75, which you notice if you're looking at my mouse here, the Heritage puts the change valve down here rather than inside of the bell tail there. Um, Engelbert Schmidt triples, which are by far the most um, the most common triple horn. I guess something we talked about lots of different makes of triples here, but as far as penetration of the North American market, if you play a triple, you probably play an Engelbert Schmidt. Um, and that's just because of the um, of the high quality of, of the make. Eighteen thousand for a high E flat, seventeen thousand for a high F. Um, save yourself about seven hundred bucks there to go high F. <laughs> of course, the Rico Cunin Innovation Triple, which, in my opinion, I think is going to really take off um, with the lightness and and uh, and innovations that have been made with the innovation triple um there are very few horns i think can uh, can compete with it this is the brand new finca 75 johannes um released at ihs uh last year this is truly a this is truly a great horn um and um a triples by dieter otto dirk and a used triple that actually very recently sold. So the, we no longer have our uh, Paxman 75L there, um, of which we had a, oh, okay. Oh, I see, I see Scott, you have responded to Donald here with the uh, bell question. Um, I think most American players use wide. Would, would you guys say that's, that's pretty, um, I think that so. that's a pretty true statement. I think so. I mean, again, I think it's just one of those things where if you are fortunate enough to get your hands on multiple different bells to try, do that, try them out, see what works for you in your situation. Because every hall, every horn is different. Um, but it does seem that people like the wide bells in American orchestras. Mm -hmm. 
I know Milver Mullen uses uses medium bell on his triple. And I know Engelbert Schmidt himself recommends the medium bell first on all of his horns. But I, um, you would probably want to start. I with think you. I've heard. Sorry, what did you say? I would, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah, you should start with the medium and see if you need to go bigger than that. I, my horn just happened to come with a white bell. And then when I bought a, uh, a new bell, I, <laughs> again, I was the other another wide bell was available. To me, so I upgraded. Um, if okay, if, unfortunately, how many do you have? Um, I can currently no triples in stock. They're all special order, but we do get uh, we do get used ones on a regular basis. So if you're looking for a used triple, I would just check back. Um, uh, just go to our French horn page and under product type, check triple horn, and you'll be able to see um, you'll be able to see what we have in stock at that time. Um, they're coming. They they come in on a pretty regular basis. This is actually an ironic time to be doing this stream. It's kind of odd for us to not have any triples in the shop. That that's not the normal situation. Okay, stop sharing. Get back on screen so I can actually say goodbye on screen. Thank you very much. Scott, for joining us. I, I appreciate your time and um, expertise. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, come anybody watching, come see me in Louisville in the orchestra. And if not, you'll, you've, you might have run into me on the internet. I post a couple times under the name. Uh, <laughs> so. would, would you like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, plug all, plug all of your social media. All. It's so easy. Channels. All Scott was your horn. It's all just my name with horn at the end. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Instagram. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Facebook. I might be on other places soon, uh, but not until the orchestra season is over. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I didn't give you proper intro introduction. Scott is third horn in the Louisville Orchestra. And just oh, So yeah. that's that's clear. That's Oh, yeah. That's fine. And, that's fine. That's my side job to okay. my, my media post. <laughs> no, if anybody in the Louisville Orchestra is watching this, that is. <laughs> also, did that make it clear? Mark is third horn in the Pittsburgh Symphony. It's a, a little job there. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Mark, for joining uh, joining us. Anything you want to plug? Social media, uh, good concerts coming up. Um, geez. Well, yeah, we're, I don't know. Um, kind of caught me off guard there. I'm thinking mostly Houghton and Horn stuff, which is, uh, you know, we've got a lot of things, uh, a lot of news, uh, that we'll share soon. Um, and so check back in with us. We're, we're, we attempt to really keep a big presence on social media and we have a great newsletter that, uh, that you can, keep up with so uh, a lot of things coming in 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 the next few months um, so stay tuned on that as far as uh, Pittsburgh Symphony goes um, you know we're we're still chugging along our season goes um, we I think our last symphonic concert is uh, in June so uh, we still got a lot left to go um, I think our next big concert is right of spring um, and that's coming up. So it's always, it's always, uh, something, um, there's always something down the pike that I got to practice for and keep up with, but, uh, mm -hmm. you can find, you can find anything you need to know on, on the website, um, Pittsburgh Um, so yeah. Uh, thanks Scott. I appreciate it. I hope maybe, maybe we can talk about doing something like this again and, and, uh, yeah, another topic. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's plenty mm -hmm. to to talk about. So, yeah, I I had tons of fun. And by the way, for the little bit of news for the 16 of you who have stuck to the very end, we <laughs> bought a new building, and I think that's actually the first public announcement of that. <laughs> we bought a church, um, which we are currently renovating. Um, so you'll be seeing a brand new, much larger and much improved out in horns here in Fort Worth, Texas, um, hopefully sooner, sooner than later, but yeah, new church, the 16 of you watching now, now. 
I'm excited. Well, I guess I keep calling it a church, but then that's going to confuse people. <laughs> it is a former church that we are turning into a musical instrument for. <laughs> oh, it's a church of brass. It's uh, come come to be anointed. <laughs> Telemon uh, <laughs> Gabrielli exclusive performing center where we're going to do all the antiphonal. <laughs> <laughs> all right um th thank thank you guys very much uh, i'm derek wright and uh, we will i'll see you on the next stream all right. okay thanks guys you know i realize the off air Bye -bye. button is over here somewhere <laughs> i derek, should have thought about where the off air button was <laughs> before i said oh and katie, katie uh, our sales manager is uh is uh, texting me we do have a used triple right now 75 so i guess <laughs> the we do have a paxman 75 in stock uh okay. used good to know so oh. so it it is there um okay now seriously how do i end this <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna make a great clip i'm just gonna, I'm gonna use this <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Restream. <laughs> okay, I guess we're just going to be streaming forever then. Oh, there we go. Here it is. Yeah.